So I welcome you all to our first year common reading program. You guys did a fantastic job of writing your papers and getting to this culminating event. I want to thank Dr. Jermaine Archer for introducing us to Daniel Black and the Cummings. Thank you, thank you, Barney. I want to thank you, a special thanks to Dr. Laura Anchor. Uh, please give a round of applause for Dr. Laura Anchor. Yes. And in the class, thank you, thank you, staff, um, who has who, who's done an amazing job teaching the book and all of you that have journeyed through the coming. What an amazing reading. We're excited to have Dr. Daniel Black here. And I'm excited to introduce him. I would ask that you kindly take your phones out and put them on time and put them away. We want our undivided attention up here. You don't have to worry about pictures because it's being documented. So please just put your devices away for the next hour or so. Silence is the enemy of history, and history is all we have. Page 75, Dr. Daniel Black, The Coming. Dr. Daniel Black is an award-winning novelist, professor, and activist. His published works include They Tell Me of a Home, The Sacred Place, Perfect Peace, Twelve Gates to the City, The Coming, and Listen to the Lands. In 2014, he won the Distinguished Writers Award from the Mid-Atlantic Writers Association. The Go Home Girl National Book Club named him Author of the Year in 2011 for his novel Perfect Place. The novel has been re reprinted more than 10 times and is being held it as an American literary classic. Dr. Black has also been nominated for the Townsend Literary Prize, the Ernest G. Gaines Award, the Pharaoh Grumpy Literary Prize, Lambda Literary Award, and Georgia, and Georgia Author of the Year Award. In 2015, Dr. Black's The Coming was published to broad critical acclaim. The novel is a first-hand account of the trauma and triumph of Africans aboard a slave ship in the 16th century. Reviewers call this work brilliant, poetic, and in a literary homage to the lives of those Africans tossed into the sea. Dr. Black's work has been justly celebrated. National Book Award winning author Charles Johnson says, the coming is, quote, powerful and brilliant. He goes on to state, this is the work to be proud of. I would like to express my gratitude to you, Dr. Black, for your remarkable genius, which throughout your life, you, consistent, you consistently exhibit with your extraordinary print pen and your principal humanity as you reach beyond the call of academic and professional duty in all your social and civic engagements. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Your tireless work in authentic and tangible ways towards social justice and improving the planet has transformed countless lives. Yes, sir. I thank you for your deeply responsible writing that is delivered with such care, historical, historical accuracy, and literary shrewdness that one feels that they are on the vessel as you cast a radiant light on the Africans' lived experiences. I marvel at how you seamlessly navigate the boundaries of academic discipline 
and allow experts and critics in their respective fields to access the text in ways that are specifically relevant to them. From the perspectives of the captives themselves, you have gifted us with a second sight that is an imaginative, an, an imaginatively layered and compelling tale of identity formation, agency, memory, folk culture, diverse communica communicative abilities, woman empowerment, and resistance to unspeakable traumas, though you speak them so incredibly well. Because science is the enemy of history, and history is all we have, your writing casts a light on the bellows of the distant yet cold voices. We see them. We, we hear them. We know the days. We know them and we know them well. They counted and remember days. We journey with the Tiba, Abutu, Chisaganda, DJ, yes, Tenito, yes. and so many more. Yeah. The coming is nothing short of a literary masterpiece. Wow. Dr. Black perceptive, perceptively shows us the importance of the circle ritual in transcending ethnic differences, differences and captures how it was strategically drawn upon as a source of renewal, endurance, and resistance. His words literally beat the African drum, rhythmically outlining the continued circle that became the, the principal foundation and form for the magical musical expressions of the country. The spirituals, the blues, the jazz. These forms shape the ethos of all American music and in turn influence every fabric of American life. The coming also casts a radiant light on African naming practices, rites of passages, craft guilds, kingship associations, country marks, and a, and a host of other symbols and characterizations illuminating them in their once obscure forms of thought and literary expression. For this, we collectively, the collective we, thank you. I have had the exceptional and amazing fortune of being a student in two of Dr. Black's classes at Clark Atlanta University some 25 years ago. I was in his freshman orientation class. Wow. So much like his freshman class, he was my professor. So literally, it's come full circle. Wow. Clark Atlanta, our mascot, is the Panther as well. And it's our homecoming week as well. So we feel a certain synergy with Old Western. And I also went to his mentoring organization in Duke. So the circle continues. Learning from this brilliant mind, I anxiously await my forthcoming rereads of the text to learn anew the subtle and explicit penetrating forays into the African and the African American past with this classic tone. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I proudly present to you the internationally renowned and acclaimed professor and author of African American literature, culture, and history, Dr. Daniel Black. Thank you, brother. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, Doc. Good evening. Try that again. Good evening. I, I think the first thing that I would like to know, right, is just how many of you liked or appreciated this book, The Coming? Yes. I appreciate that. Yes. So if you would, just for me, just for my own self-worth, right, clap as loudly as you love the book. I appreciate that, yes. Thank you so much. How many of you say, I learned things in this book that I did not know? Good. Awesome, awesome. I'm going to read an excerpt from the book. I'm going to talk about how I put the book together. Uh, several people have asked me all kinds of questions, and so I'm going to try to answer all your questions. And then I'm going to sign everybody's book in this room. If you brought your book, I'm going to sign it for you. Some of you are looking like, oh, dang, I left my book. Oh, no. OK, well, while I'm signing some people's book, you can run back to your room and get your book, and I'll wait on you. <laughs> all right. And then came the disaster. With open arms, we embraced those who looked nothing like us. 
assuming all life honors life. But we were wrong. In the end, we fed and strengthened our own captors. We cannot claim naivete. We cannot say we were people undeveloped. We cannot say there were no signs. We can say only that we did not heed them. Sound wisdom was as common to us as the evening breeze. We scoffed and shrugged at elders forewarning of a time of great tragedy and chaos. We did not believe them. We had learned to ignore our own gods, to take their goodness for granted, to believe that because of them we were immune to external attack. So we did not hear them. We heard only what we sought to hear. But now we hear it all echoing in our regretful memories. If only we could have seen into the future, we might have avoided the onslaught. Most of us had no such powers. The few who did, the seers and sages, we had dismissed. They were always speaking of things to come, warning of impending disasters that rarely came to pass, at least in our lifetime. Now we know that prophecies come to one generation, but materialize in another. If only we had listened, if only we had had more disciplined ears, but we did not. And so we blamed ourselves, we blamed our gods, we blamed each other, but there was no one to blame, only shame to bear, and pity, yes, great pity, that a people so strong missed so many clues. The forest whispered it, the birds chirped it, the trees waved it, the antelope danced it, the tall grass swayed it, the lions roared it, the elders said it over and over. Beware, seek not the thing you do not need. Greed destroys wisdom. Let just enough be enough. But we were too blessed. Our abundance suggested immortality, so we stopped searching for invisible things. Our mothers had worked so hard that we didn't have to. Our fathers had killed enough game that their sons hardly knew the hunt. We didn't know then what we know now. A life of leisure destroys a child. When there's nothing to work for, there's nothing to gain, nothing to die for. So we had to die that we might live again. And that's what we did. We died. By the thousands and hundreds of thousands, we died. We'd never seen such unjustifiable violence, bloody bodies lying prostrate across the earth as if pleading for forgiveness. Those who survived did not mourn. There was no time. The loss was too great. We still have not mourned. We still have no time. We remember, yes, but we have not mourned. And so death came quickly. It came unannounced. It came cloaked in our own garb. It came white as clouds, smiling as if it loved us. Death came in the darkness of night while we were laughing and talking with ancestors. It came in legions with guns and ammunition too powerful to battle. Death came like the monsoon winds. It came like a flood. It came with earth-shaking force we could not control. Death came under the authority of nations we did not know. It came with men whose absent wives benefited from their husbands' despicable behavior. It came with men whose children would one day inherit their father's legacy of violence and wealth ill-gained. Death came to strip the land of its glory. It came to thousands and hundreds of thousands without sympathy for our loss. It came with impaled brutality. Death came to scatter children's blood-soaked bodies about the earth, thus fertilizing dry, yearning soil. In truth, and in the end, death came to teach us that we were brothers. And now we know, but this was the coming. Some were taken by surprise. Some were killed on the spot. Some were taken in their sleep. Some were ambushed in the forest. Some were tricked into believing they were going for a walk. Some consumed with hatred were caught off guard. Some were inebriated. Some were too lazy to fight. Some were busy settling communal affairs. Some were nursing wounds inflicted by spouses. Some were telling children bedtime stories of talking spiders. Some were beating drums to warn the rest of us. But most of us were not listening. And when the drums fell silent, it was too late. Our destruction was complete. 
An entire village destroyed in one solitary cycle of the sun and moon. They destroyed our homes and forced our leaving. They bound us with chains of heavy iron. Elders rendered mute and lifeless. Babies deprived of life's knowing. All we could do was wonder. We did not speak. There was nothing to say. In those moments, we heard our elders' warnings and we understood. We knew they loved us now far more than we had understood before. But they could not hear our cries, our pleas of lament, not with the ears of the living. And so one by one, by one by one, they took us away. They took the farmers first, those who knew the land, the earth, the ingredients of the soil, those who heard its rumble, felt its movement, understood its seasons, they took them first. Those who knew seeds and germination, plant spacing and harvest, those who walked barefoot upon the soil in homage to its life-sustaining power, they took them first. It was no accident. They would farm again in a new world, feeding a nation committed to their degradation. And after the farmers, they took the healers. They were not hard to find. Most days, healers lingered about the village, repairing bodies and minds too troubled to heal alone. If they took our healers, they must have assumed, they took our ability to mend, and they were right. So they captured our healers that we might not rebound. Villages of frightened, wounded people without medicine men and women would take centuries to restore. They knew this. Their strategy was as calculated as the hyena's attack. Without healers, who would usher life back into our suffering souls? Who would reassure us that death had not come to stay? Who would cleanse the forest, the land of evil energy? We did not know. All we knew for sure was that our pride deteriorated into fractured, deep-seated insecurities. On the 13th day at sea, our humming began at a cool, even pace when beats were slow and lulling. A man purred a dark melody. And then repeated it. It wasn't a groan from pain and desolation, but deliberate lines of constructed meter and time that jarred our spirits and invited our participation. And so we joined in. One by one. Some in the upper registers, some in the depths of the voice. having found a language that needed no words. We hummed until we knew we'd survive. Mm -hmm. We hummed until we released mothers and fathers whom we'd never see again. Mm -hmm. We hummed until our love for and gratitude to each other was clear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We hummed a celebration for living, for fighting, for refusing to die when, when dying would have been so much easier. Mm -hmm. For still believing against all odds that we'd get home someday. We hummed our commitment to raise children wherever we went in the way of our people. Mm -hmm. We hummed that our women slightly above us might know we hadn't forgotten them. We hummed for the dead lying next to us. We hummed for children not yet born. We hummed for kinsmen, yesterday's enemies, who are now precious, coveted friends. And we hummed. It was all we knew to do until the 64th day. And on the 64th day, we began to say our names in succession it was a kind of roll call, a daily announcement of the yet living. We said our names aloud that we might know that we were still there. Someone would beat his planks like a drum and say his own name three times. That was the sign, that was the beginning. And then the rest of us would join in, saying our names proud, beating our planks, announcing that they had not destroyed all of us. Amadi. Coyote, Kwesi, Abubakar, Dumi, 
Atiba, Agbona, Bekatimbe, Chitope, Naja, Damani, Usman, Yoro, Chukwudi, Wale, Oshun Dwagwike, Alatanga, Tafata Ona, and so many, many, many more. When there was silence, we knew a warrior had fallen. We didn't always remember his name, but we ceased drumming long enough to honor his memory. Then fists pounded again until every living soul made his living presence known. And then slightly above us, our women did the same, shouting their names to let us know they were yet living. Chitalala, Tegbe, Pepukaye, Chisanganda, Omalara, Jahap, Anela, Kariamu, Osizwe, Binta, Olutobi, Titilayo, Anoa, Ayodele, Dufue, and so many, many more. We struck plates once between each name. There were other names too, far too many for us to recall. Yet with each name, we nodded and we knew that we had survived. On the 76th day, after it had rained so badly that all of us were practically sick, we wondered if one day one of us might write this story about what we'd seen and endured. We wondered if a day would ever come when our children's children's children would not want to hear this story. Would a moment ever arrive when we would have to convince our own that we had done this for them, that we had lived for them, that we had survived, in fact, for them? We needed a record, we decided, a record of our experience, lest the day come when our children found this story implausible. We needed a book to tell the world of our glorious kingdoms and our spirit-filled rituals, lest people believe we'd always been slaves. But who would write that book? And what language would they use? And where would you begin this story? No one would believe that we had spent weeks, no, months, in a ship bound with chains, with barely enough food to fill our palms. No one would believe that we had rested upon the great waters for three, sometimes six months. No one would believe that they had thrown our brothers, our sisters, our mothers and fathers into the waters. Yes, one of us would have to write a book so the world would know who we were. And young people, I've come because it looks like I was the one who wrote the book. I think that, I think a couple of things. First of all, I'm really honored that you read the book. I'm honored that you wrote about it. But I have to tell you this. I'm most honored, I'm most honored that a diverse group of young people such as yourselves here at Old Westbury, I'm most honored that all of you now understand that they didn't take cargo. They didn't take objects across the Atlantic Ocean. They took people. They took human beings. Human beings who had names human beings who had hopes, who had dreams, who had desires. And I researched this book. I probably spent 16, 15, 16 years researching this book. I read every slave narrative I could get my hand on. I read, oh God, I read um, Rydeker's The Slave Ship. I read Black Cargoes by Mannix and Cowley. I read everything, I read articles, I read books about how they put slave ships together. I read everything I could get my hands on in order to really create a narrative that would tell you a story that none of us could ever say wasn't true. I didn't want anybody to ever tell me, oh my God, that really sounds amazing, but it's fiction, isn't it? Nothing in this book is untrue. Everything in this book has a historical reference for it. It's considered a novel because, of course, I created the storyline around it. But I think it's extremely important to say that. Another thing I'll tell you is this book was excruciatingly difficult to write emotionally. 
Was it emotionally difficult for any of you to read? We raise your hand if you say this was a hard read emotionally. Yeah, I feel you. I, I feel you. Listen, I really feel you. Um, a little earlier, someone asked me, what did you do every day? Like, how did you, how did you stand do, doing this writing every day? And my answer is this. I have a living room sofa that became my plank. Every day in order for me to write this book, in order for it to keep flowing in my mind, I had to stretch out literally on my living room sofa and close my eyes and I had my laptop on my chest. And I was lying this way, right? And literally there were days where I would find myself rocking as if I were literally on this ship. My laptop was swaying, right? as I just continued to write. And, it's the, uh, and if I ever got off my sofa, I could not write any more of this text. Because in order to tell this story clearly, the ancestors were saying, we won't tell you about the Middle Passage, you have to take the journey with us. You have to go. And so every day, day, day in, day out, day out, I had to get on that plank and experience the smell, this stench, and if I did a good job, which I'm praying I did, I was trying to do that for you too. So that when you read it, I hope you felt like, oh my God, I was on the boat. I was right there, I could smell it, I could see it. Because the point is for us to get clear that we can never, ever, ever treat human beings like this again. This is unacceptable. It's unacceptable. We can't do this. I don't care who is in control. I don't care who's in the White House. We cannot treat people like this. And yes, you can clap. Absolutely. I, I studied at Oxford, Oxford, England, um, several years, and I found out that in Oxford, England, they have these huge slave ledgers, right? Most of these slave ships, they created these great big ledgers where they kept records. They kept records of how much food they had. They kept records of how many enslaved people they had taken. They kept record of how many they'd thrown overboard. They, took, they kept record of how many crewmen were on the ship. Well, these big records, these big ledgers, they would have to turn into the crown after they completed their journey, right? And so, when I was at Oxford, I found out that some of these ledgers were in the basement of the Oxford Library, right? So I said, well, I'm going to see these ledgers, right? And they were saying, well, no, no, people, no person can touch it, you know, it, 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 it's, off, it's off limits and you can't touch these records. And of course, I'm saying, the hell I can't, you know. <laughs> this record's about my people, of course I can. So I kind of found my way into the basement. <laughs> Y'all know how that goes. <laughs> um, and I, and, and I opened the, the first page of this letter and I had chills all over me. Because in these ledgers, they had these African people listed, not by name, but by number. Right, African, two. African, number eight. African, number six. African child, number 17. African woman, number 16. And everybody had simply a number. And I began to wonder, what were their names? Right. And then I had a friend, you know, when I started writing this book, he said, well, Black, how would you know what their names were? This was so long ago. How could you possibly have known what their names would be? And I said, well, brother, you know what? If you were white, right, and if it was in the 16th century, what would your name be? And he said, well, you know, probably like Elizabeth, you know, it's fine, you know, George. And I said, well, fine. Then if you're in 16th century, Nigeria, why wouldn't you have the same names that the, that the folks there have now? Why can't we imagine that we passed along names like any other and every other culture did? And some of the problem is that we have not understood that these people were human beings. And so names were not really critical. I had a great historian from Yale send me an amazing note when this book came out. And he said, Dr. Black, you know what I think is the greatest achievement of your book? He said, never in the history of the Middle Passage have I ever seen somebody talk about an enslaved African's name. In all my research, I've never seen anybody name them. He said, it's just so amazing that you would, that you would acquire, that you would give names to these black bodies. And I said, the fact that we haven't done so tells us a lot about what we think about black people these nameless individuals that we can shuffle around the world and sell 
for a nickel, for a dime, for a dollar. And so I think, that, I think the naming was really, really, really very, very, very important. The other thing I want to say, how many, of, how many of you were a little shocked about the rape of the boys? Oh, a lot of you. Who says, I've never heard that they raped the men too? Wow, wow, wow. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And the reason this is important, it's important, of course, because it happened. But it's also important because when we start talking about explaining and understanding the cycle, I'm going to have to move this. All right, I'm good. When we start talking about explaining and understanding the psychosexual politics in America, we can't really do that without explaining the beginnings, right, of the sexual use of black bodies in this country. And so understanding that all bodies black of all genders were used in this sexual way helps us be to begin to understand that the seed of black sexuality, the seed of really sexuality in America, starts during this moment called the Middle Passage. So I think that's very, very important for us to know. Um, two other things I'll say, and then I'm going to take questions. One of them was I found this remarkable thing as I was researching. They talked about these singing chains. And that was this idea that these, that these chained Africans, when they would put them below deck, very often at night, they would, they would use their chains as instruments, right? All kinds of rhythm, rhythms, all kinds of polyrhythms, and that they would literally rattle their chains in rhythm. And one, one guy, Alexander Falconbridge, talks about how these chains created what he calls a symphony of horror that laying in his own bunk, he could hear these chains and various rhythms of these chains playing all at once. That while one chain is going ching, 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 another's going ching, 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 another's going boom, 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 and another one is going boom, ba da da, boom, ba da, and all of this is going on all at once, and all of them are chained down, right? So the thing that really fascinated me, right, is how in the world, how in the world, Dr. Archer, do you capture a people? How do you chain a people down? And then they use the means of their bondage as a form of musical instrumentation. And then I, I did more research and I kept, I kept running over this notion of these singing chains over and over and over again. And I was absolutely fascinated, just completely fascinated by these chains. And I, and I tried to hear in my head, in fact, I teach at Clark Atlanta, and I actually took some chains to class and gave each student, right, a piece of chain, and I, want, and, I, and I had them play it. And it was like 20, 25 of us in class. And when you hear all of this at once, it's absolutely, really, truly moving. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal thing. But it's a phenomenal people, right, who can really transmute, again, the means of their bondage into a musical symphony. The last thing I think I'll tell you, and then take some questions, is when I finish this book, um, someone asked me earlier, too, I want to make sure I answer. When I finished this book, the question was, how did you emotionally come out of this, right? What did you do to restore your own kind of psychology? How, what did you do to, to restore yourself emotionally? And what I actually did was I went in my front yard, literally, and I lay upon the earth, right? And I did it for days and days because I was really, truly an emotional wreck when I finished this book. Um, and I just, I just laid upon the earth. And the earth has a way of stilling you, right? It's kind of ritualistic. The, the earth has a way of, of, of kind of getting a person back to center. And so laying upon the earth really kind of brought my emotions back down. There were days where in writing this book, I really wanted to fight somebody. Like I really, I mean, I wanted to go for broke, right? But I said, black, you can't do that. Hold it down, you know, hold it down, be cool, be cool. So, you know, um, I, I suppose I held on. But I really, really, really had a difficult time I pray that in all of your reading this book, I pray that the one thing also that you would get is that everybody in this room, somebody paid for you. Somebody paid for you, y'all. Somebody paid for you. 
Somebody decided you were worth enough to go to this school called Old Westbury. Somebody decided that they'd sacrifice something to help pay this tuition. Somebody decided they'd sacrifice something just to help you get here freshman week. Somebody decided they'd sacrifice something to, you know, to send you a care package. Somebody decided they'd sacrifice something to send you $20 to keep your head above ground. And I just want you to be real clear that because somebody paid for you, that you owe a graduation. You owe a graduation. You have to walk across a stage in four years, okay, maybe five, but you gotta do it. And you have to do it because somebody already agreed that you would, and they, and they paid the price so that you would. So I wanna tell you how much I love you all. I thank you, I thank you for being, for, thank you for having me. Dr. Archer, do, do most of y'all know Dr. Archer? Dr. Archer is an awesome man. Give him a round of applause. That's the man. I have, enough, I have another son here somewhere, Professor Ronaldo Murray, right, who's awesome, 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 awesome. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> What's up, man? Yes, yes. And I'm really, really happy. I, I also have family here who came all the way from New York City to be here with me in Dugan Zinga. Where are you? Y'all are somewhere. Whoa, yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you, thank you. My dear, dear, dear friend and buddy, uh, the great, wonderful writer and actor, Keith Hamilton Cobb came all the way down to, to chill with me tonight. Keith, wave your hands there. Yes, thank you so much. I wanna thank Lisa Gazzardi. Where's Lisa? Lisa, where are you? Lisa, yes, yes. She's the one who made all of this possible. Absolutely. I want to thank Laura Anker, who's, uh, who couldn't be here tonight, but I'm really, really happy uh, that she did so much, so very much to get me here.